Hello everyone! Let's say, hypothetically, that I was holding you at gunpoint. I ask you the question, what's the most important effect for cinematic realism? Would you say it's bloom? HDR? Motion blur? I know that if it were me, I would say... This is depth of field, a cinematic post-processing technique that attempts to simulate a realistic camera lens. Depth of field is your one-stop shop for making anything look more realistic, more professional, and more sophisticated, from video game photography to your random Twitter devlog posts. Using depth of field is the game developer equivalent of posting a painting you spent a week on and calling it a quick sketch. Games like Horizon Forbidden West, The Last of Us Part 1, and God of War Ragnarok are making use of incredibly sophisticated depth of field to really sell that cinematic movie game feel, while other games like Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 are showing off amazing autofocus. Even indie games have cracked the code. Depth of field accounts for 75% of Valheim's art direction. Before we try and make it ourselves though, we need to learn a little bit about how cameras actually work. At a basic level, inside your camera is something called an aperture, a focusing lens, and a sensor. Light rays enter the aperture and the lens will focus these rays down into a single point for the sensor to receive. The distance of the lens from the sensor will change how sharp the output is, since the light rays won't be focused to a single point, and will instead spread out and blend with other pixels. Lastly, the aperture controls how much light enters the lens. The smaller the aperture, the smaller the range of focus. By taking note of this behavior, we can start constructing a simple mathematical model. This model divides the range of focus into two halves, the near field and the far field. F will be our focal plane, the distance at which pixels should be fully sharp. Then, we have the distance at which the near field gets blurrier until it is completely out of focus, and the same for the far field. We can convert our model into a function that takes in a depth value and outputs how sharp that pixel should be, where 1 is out of focus and 0 is completely sharp. We call this output the camera's circle of confusion, and when we apply it to Final Fantasy's depth buffer, we can see our near field and far field respectively. The distance and range of focus will change with our parameters, demonstrating the core functionality of the effect but we still need to get a version of the image that's out of focus. As I stated earlier, the circle of confusion divides our image into two halves, the near field and the far field, both of which need to be blurred. For the near field, all we need to do is apply a simple Gaussian, but for the far field, we need to be a little smarter. We first want to multiply the color buffer with the far circle of confusion, which blacks out anything that is not part of the far field. This helps us by preventing pixels that are in the foreground from influencing the pixels in the background, since that wouldn't make any sense. Then we apply our Gaussian and we're all good to go. Now that we have our blurred near and far fields, all we have to do is blend them with the original image based on the circle of confusion. This is pretty simple. We do the far field first since it's the background. We sample the far circle of confusion and then interpolate from the original pixel to the far field blur. Then we sample the near circle of confusion and interpolate from the previous result to the near field blur and we're all finished. Now, I know what you're saying. Ace Rolla, this looks like shit. And you're right. The first and most obvious issue is the near field blending. It looks absolutely terrible. In real photographs, if a nearby object is out of focus, it's going to bleed onto the background. Our current blending method doesn't account for this, and to fix that, we need to make some modifications to the near field circle of confusion. To get our near field to bleed, we need to first expand its range of influence. We can do this by applying a max filter. For each pixel, we center a square around it and set the the center pixel to the max pixel value in that square, which will give us expanded edges. Then we do a simple box blur to soften those new edges. This change to the circle of confusion makes near field blending look much better and more realistic, but there's still one big problem with our depth of field. If you're a photographer, you may have already noticed it, but our blurred images look absolutely nothing like an out of focus photo. 
An out-of-focus lens is going to condense all of those light rays into a flat circle that projects onto the sensor rather than a Gaussian average of all of those rays, which makes an out-of-focus photo the result of a whole bunch of flat circles plastered and blended on top of each other. With this in mind, we'll have to make use of a different, lesser-known kind of blurring technique called the bokeh blur. Bokeh is the Japanese word for blur, which means that bokeh blur translates directly to, uh, well, the name does not give us any indication as to what it does, but it's Japanese, so it's probably cool. Contextually, bokeh refers to the shape of our camera aperture. This is usually a circle, which is why most out-of-focus photos are characterized by circular highlights. A bokeh blur refers to the blurring of an image with a shaped kernel to try and simulate those shaped highlights. For the nerds heading down to the comment section, yes, this does mean that the box blur is technically a bokeh blur. Now, you might be asking yourself, Ace Rolla, how do we get a circular kernel? And the answer to that is we go to the source code of the paper that I'm referencing and we copy and paste their array of offsets for a circular kernel. This array contains 48 offsets in a circular pattern with three rings, totaling 49 samples if we include the center pixel. This may sound like a lot, which it is. The bokeh blur works like the box blur, where every pixel has the same weight, so all we need to do is iterate through the offset array, sampling each pixel at each offset, adding the color to a total, and then dividing the sum by 49 to average it out. Replacing the Gaussian blur with our new fancy bokeh blur, the depth of field should now look much more correct. It's hard to see, but the circular highlights are there. We can make them more obvious by increasing the exposure, but this is going to blow out our image. I promise I'm not faking you out for a second time. Our depth of field is actually finished, but the reason our results don't look correct is because of the image itself. In the real world, direct rays of light from something like the sun are going to be much, much brighter than diffused light rays that bounced off a dark corner of a room. This difference in luma is accurately captured by our out-of-focus camera lens, where very bright rays are going to overpower all the other light rays, resulting in those bright, solid, circular highlights. Graphics engines try to accurately represent and simulate these major differences in luma with high dynamic range, where zero is black and pixels can be as bright as they want. This means that game developers and people doing tech demos of their depth of field implementations have the privilege of high dynamic range to make their bokeh blur look accurate, but unfortunately for us, we are working within the confines of reshade on Final Fantasy XIV, which is not high dynamic range. Instead, our Final Fantasy color buffer is an SDR, meaning that 0 is black and 1 is white. Numerically speaking, 0 and 1 are are not that far apart, which means our bokeh blur doesn't really understand or recognize that these stars should be considered very bright. So how do we fix this? My initial solution to this problem was to simulate exposure by keeping track of the brightest pixel in the kernel. Depending on how exposed I wanted the highlights to be, I would interpolate from the average to the brightest value of the kernel. This gives interesting results which feel correct at first glance, but this ends up accentuating everything rather than only the brighter pixels, but it does look pretty cool when we extrapolate the max. Unfortunately though, these results are not even close to satisfactory, so into the trash it goes. Since faking it won't be good enough, we'll just have to fake something else instead and make our color values more accurate to how they would be in the real world. In other words, converting our SDR values to HDR. I've talked about tone mapping many times in my videos as the method by which graphics engines convert their HDR color values to SDR, such that your monitor can properly visualize the colors. This logic goes both ways. If we apply an inverse tone map to our SDR values, then we can bring them back into HDR. Tone mappers are just functions, so if we calculate the inverse of the function, then we have an inverse tone mapper. For my demonstrations, I'll be using lots, not just because it's simple, but because I think it gives the best results as well. The 
Lot's Tone Mapper is the color divided by 1 plus the luminance of the color. It takes in any high dynamic range color and compresses it down to 0 to 1. The inverse of the Lot's Tone Mapper is the color divided by 1 minus the luminance of the color, which takes in any color between 0 to 1 and sends those brighter colors off to infinity. Implementing this into our depth of field is very simple. All we do is apply the inverse tone map to our color buffer before we do the rest of the effect. The inverse tone mapper makes a huge difference and gives us the accentuated highlights that we want, but we can do even better with a technique invented by yours truly. High dynamic range can cause some very big problems, the most obvious of which arises with undersampling. At a high level, undersampling refers to a technique in which we do far less samples than would be ideal, but still manages to give a decent output. In shader programming, we are pretty much always undersampling, since we want to do as few samples as possible to get the best image we can while still keeping an acceptable frame rate. Our circular bokeh kernel is one such example we are doing as few samples as possible, but still getting a good result. But since we have such a small sample size, major outliers can heavily skew an average. A common example of this dilemma is Bloom. Bloom is a cinematic image effect that captures bright pixels, blurs them, and then blends them back into the image to simulate bright light overwhelming a scene. Consider a normal, peaceful scene with Bloom applied. Now imagine a singular, infinitely bright pixel suddenly appeared on the screen. What do you think would happen? If you answered, it would look like shit, then you'd be correct. Random bright pixels appearing out of nowhere are referred to as fireflies. They can come from anywhere, such as occluded emissive surfaces or artifacts from other shader effects. To fix the issues caused by fireflies, we want to weigh our samples by their luminance. We divide one by the luminance of the pixel plus one and multiply it with our sample, add it to a sum, and then we divide the total sum of the samples by the sum of their weights. This will give much less weight to extremely bright pixels, preventing them from completely dominating the sample space. Switching back to the bloom, we can see that the firefly no longer ruins our image and stays as an isolated bright pixel. The luminance weighted average is known as the Keras average, and I'm sure all of you are now scrambling over to Google to learn about this new concept that I have presented, but you'll notice that there is only one result that appears, a random comment in a Bloom repo with no other information. This has been an accurate simulation of what it's like to try and learn anything about graphics programming concepts. This begs the question, where did you learn about the Keras average Mr. Rolla? And unfortunately, I legally cannot tell you. I hope that helps. Oh no! I've just wasted the past minute of your life explaining how to do the exact opposite of what we wanted to do. What we've done is suppress the bright pixels, but what we want to do is accentuate them for our bokeh blur. Thankfully, that's really easy. We just do the inverse of the Keras average while doing our bokeh blur samples, and as you can see, our brighter highlights have gotten even brighter. Making use of inverse tone mapping and inverse Keras averaging allows our SDR color buffer to give much better and much more realistic results. I've read through pretty much every document on depth of field, and as far as I'm aware, I am the first person to make use of this combination of techniques. But I cannot take all the credit, as it was a member of my Discord server that suggested the idea of inverse tone mapping to begin with. Our depth of field is finished! It's conceptually a pretty simple effect to implement, but there is great nuance in the way we create our circle of confusion, the way we blend the near and far fields, the way we interpret color data, and the way we sample that color data as well. Speaking of the way we sample it, what about other kernel shapes? I mentioned earlier that a box blur is technically a bokeh blur, where the bokeh shape is square. We can also rotate this however we want. We can do this for any shape, like a diamond, a hexagon, a star, or my personal favorite, the octagon. If you're an aspiring social media game developer writing daily Twitter threads on how you implemented simple game mechanics in order to farm engagement, making use of depth of field is the easiest way for you to immediately up your graphics and start farming those comments about how good your game looks. Or, if you're a video game photographer, it's probably time you start messing with those depth of field settings. This video was brought to you by my wonderful patrons. If you'd like to have a say in what I do next, 
all my patrons get to vote on the next video topic. Pretty much everything I do in my videos gets reused in future videos. So if you'd like to control the evolution of the channel tech tree, then I would really appreciate your support in achieving my goal of full-time content creation. Anyways, that's all from me. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll see you next time.